Evening, everyone. My name is Bob Moore, and on behalf of the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce Community Relations Committee, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's special meeting on architecture in Fairfield. And first, I'd like to thank the Narducci's for having uh, this event in their lovely new building, which we'll learn a little more about as the meeting goes on. Thank you, Brenda. You're welcome. My pleasure. For those of you who are, who are not familiar with the history and purpose of the Community Relations Committee, I'll take a few moments to provide you with an overview. The committee began to take shape after the November 1997 Fairfield mayoral elections when tensions were running high between native Fairfielders and meditators in our community. A handful of people decided to take some kind of action to see if we could find a common ground between these two groups. Over the next several months, about 20 Fairfield area residents, which represented a good cross-section of interests within the community, met several times to explore the issues, to get to know each other, and to begin to craft a common vision. Then early in 1998, the Chamber of Commerce officially formed the Community Relations Committee, and the group grew to about 35 individuals who stepped forward from various community service clubs and other community interest groups. After a few monthly meetings of getting to know each other by candidly exploring lifestyle differences, concerns, fears, and common desires among the participants, the purpose of the CRC was crafted, that purpose being to promote greater understanding and mutual respect among the citizens of Jefferson County. The committee then went, met once per month to continue to explore how to implement the vision. One of the achievements of the Community Relations Committee was arranging for the Fairfield and MSAE school boards and their spouses to meet at a dinner party for the first time since 1974. And you were there, <laughs> that's right. Another achievement <clears throat> has been the launching and promotion of the Fairfield Heritage Park Brick Campaign. And for those of you who want to learn more about that project or who haven't pur purchased a brick yet can find a brochure out on the table after the meeting. As the number of attendees at our monthly meetings began to dwindle, we decided it was time to adopt a new format and to hold quarterly meetings. We decided to open the meetings up to the public and to select topics of uh, various subjects that are of interest to a good cross-section of the community. This evening we'll address architecture in Fairfield with an emphasis on Stapacha Vade. Moderating this evening's meeting are jo it's Jody Kerr, President-elect of the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce and Chairperson of the Community Relations Committee. And I'd like to turn the meeting over to Jody now. <clears throat> Thanks, Bob. I, I would like to join Bob in welcoming everyone here tonight and great to see such a, a nice attendance for our meeting and the interest that there is in this particular topic. I want to just briefly mention who our, our panelists are, and I'll let them give a little more details about themselves. First on our, with our panelists is Jonathan Lippman, who is the architect for Maharishi Global Construction. Mm -hmm. Terry Hayes, who's a local realtor with Century 21. Brendan Arducci, who's owner of this building at Chapel Studio. And Jeff Andyway, a local contractor in the Fairfield area that has um, done some building of these particular structures. I want to just briefly mention, go over the format of the meeting. Most of you should have an agenda. If you don't already, there's some more available. As you can see, we plan to, uh, we've got some allotted time for each of our panelists to present the materials that they've prepared for this particular meeting. And at the end of that time, which we plan to run approximately an hour total, we'll allow 30 minutes for some questions. And the format that we chose, and it worked very well at our last quarterly meeting, we have some pads and pens up front and we can get those circulated throughout the meeting. If you have a question about anything particular that they are addressing or talking about that is dealing with the subject at hand this evening, then I would encourage you to jot your question down and get those to either Kevin Tui or Bob Phipps. They can bring those up front and I will read those then and whoever the question actually pertains to as far as our panelists go they will respond to your question and we do keep it at the 30 minutes and I would like to just mention um, 
We'd like everyone to practice just common courtesies of any meeting of this nature. Cell phones turned off, listen respectfully and thoughtfully, no side conversations and, or interruptions, and please use an appropriate sense of humor. So, <laughs> wherever that's appropriate. So, we'll go ahead and get started uh, with our first speaker, Jonathan Lipman. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm asked to say a little more about myself. So, yeah, yeah, right. I, I am uh, Chief Architect at Maharshi Global Construction, and what that means is that I am, my office are the conduit for transmitting information on Maharshi Stapacha Bay for anyone in North America who wants to use it in buildings they design. And so I've been a kind of apprentice learning this knowledge over the past three and a half years since the company was founded by Doug Greenfield. And um, I guess that's why I was asked to speak. We talked a little bit about what kind of things I should cover, and what I had in mind to talk about is um, to give a little capsule summary of what position this occupies within the world at large in the United States, and um, how much Maharshi Stapacha Bay construction there is here in Fairfield, what it is, what the principles, what the theory is behind it, what some of the medical and scientific research has been done that may help us to understand why it has effects. What the benefits are that we, we propose that we believe that it has and what kind of experiences people in the buildings are having. What are the obvious elements in Stapachevade buildings, which probably anyone in this room could call out to me, but I'll explain a little bit about them. Um, and what Maharshi Global Construction does, kind of how it works that you can have a Stapachevade building. So that's the overview on what I've been asked to talk about, and I'll try to do it in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. First of all, <clears throat> this knowledge, uh, what do these words mean? Well, we know, we know we've all heard the name Maharishi, um, and Stapachya is a Sanskrit word that is related to the English word establish, and it actually means establishment or establishing or creating things. And Veda is knowledge of nature or science or knowledge of natural law. So this is Maharishi's body of knowledge that has to do with how things are established which can include how buildings are built. Now we have his name on the front because this knowledge has been around for thousands of years, but it has deteriorated over that time and he has over the last 20 years focused on reviving it and bringing it out in its authentic form and so we signify that this is his kind of reinvigoration of it and um, restatement of it as, as the original thing by putting his name in front of this word Stapachave. So that's the name. And it, his, his revival of it is about 12 years old. Um, and there, is, there are buildings around the world that have been built using the principles of Stapachave. Um, before that, um, and historically you can see, of course, historically most of the examples are found in India, but there are influences of it that you find throughout the East, China, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, and there are some elements that seem to have gone into the Arab world historically and even into the Mediterranean and South America. So a few elements of it um, were dispersed over the millennia probably around the entire world. Um, but we're in the midst of a, a recent revival, um, and there are about $200 million worth of buildings built using this knowledge in the United States over the last five or six years. Um, about a third of those buildings, maybe half of those buildings, are here in Fairfield. Um, I would say there's something in between 60 and $100 million worth of buildings built using this knowledge in Fairfield. And uh, that totals somewhere around 100 or 110 buildings, okay? 
Now, what are the principles of Maharshi Stipachaved? This is really, in its ultimate form, it's not about building buildings. It's insights into how the, all of the environments in the universe are created, how they're organized, how solar systems are organized, how bodies are organized, how planets are organized. And one of the underlying principles in it is that if you can organize buildings or cities using some of these same principles, that it turns out to have a very beneficial effect upon the people who occupy them. So the practical application is designing houses, designing buildings, and laying out cities. And that's really all that we'll talk about tonight. Now, one of the basic principles in Stepachaved is that the sun is the most powerful influence of natural law on Earth. And I think that's a fairly unchallengeable statement to make. But Stepachaved has a body of knowledge about influences that the sun and the sun's energy have on us that are simply not widely known. Um, the thesis is that the sun, as well as the rest of the celestial bodies that pass overhead from, from east to west, and the North Pole, the South Pole, the magnetic North Pole, the revolving of the Earth on its axis, these combinations of, of eternal forces on the Earth that we evolved within have different kinds of effects upon us and that we can access those effects in, for instance, the directions that we face when we do certain things, the directions we face our buildings, et cetera, to take advantage of these influences so that they have beneficial effects on us. Um, specifically, if we use these principles wisely, then the effects that our buildings can have on us is that they can promote happiness and prosperity and health. All three good things. It'd be great to live in a building that could create those things in our lives. And that is the starting point. Now, how could it be that a building could affect our happiness, our prosperity, and our health? Because normally, we're simply not aware of any ways that such effects could occur from a building. So let's focus on that a little bit. There are four different areas of Maharshi Stipachaved. And if I lay out what those four are, then we can talk about how it works. The first is orientation. That is to say that there is an effect upon us based upon these influences of the sun passing overhead and the other celestial bodies and the earth spinning on its axis and the magnetic pole up to the north, there is an effect upon us of caused by the direction we're facing. There is an effect upon us also by the orientation of a building that we are in. So area number one in Stipachaved is orientation of the building and of yourself and the effects of the different orientations, and we speak of eight generally, north, south, east, and west, and then the four diagonal directions, are known and laid out in Stipachaved. The second area is uh, placement. That is to say that within a building, for example, since we're really talking about buildings tonight, where you place the different activities that you do within a building, where the different rooms are with different functions, where the kitchen is, where a bedroom is, where a study is, has an impact upon the activity that you do in it. We actually say that because of the, the passage of the sun overhead and the fact that Stepajave tells us that the energy of the sun has different qualities at different points in its passage overhead, and that these different qualities influence our activity, that there is a certain place within a house, for instance, that is going to promote, for instance, promote digestion and would be a, an ideal place to have a, a dining room or a kitchen. There's another place that would 
promote rest and would be a wise place to put a bedroom, another place that might promote conviviality and therefore would be a useful place in which to put a living room. And it would be inefficient or ineffective to have your bedroom in the place that promotes digestion because then when you would lie down to bed every night, you would get hungry. So this kind of very practical, simple information is, is part of the information which is in it under the second category of placement. The third is proportion. Everything in nature has its own internal proportions and almost everything in nature actually has mathematical proportion that can be expressed in, in very simple mathematical formulas. And the theory in Stepachevaid is that these natural systems of proportion, if used in the design of a building, in the layout of houses, in the layout of rooms, have a beneficial effect on us. That we feel more at home, at home in the natural environment, using these proportions of nature, than we would otherwise in conventional buildings that don't use them. So these are the three main areas, orientation, placement, and proportion. Maharishi, in creating this revival of Stepachevade and clearing away thousands of years of, of distortion that has gradually crept into this knowledge, reviving it in its purity, has added a fourth area, which is the materials that you build a building out of. Because within recent decades, we, through great ad wonderful advances in technology, have, in spite of our best intentions, managed to build buildings that in some cases, poison their inhabitants. We've actually had to invent the phrase sick building syndrome. And Stepachevade says that if there is this knowledge that you can use to build a building that will make its inhabitants healthier and more successful and happier, that the building at the same time shouldn't poison them. And so we recommend using natural and non-toxic materials as the fourth major area of Stepachevade. Now, so that's a real thumbnail summary of what it is. And let me now take about 10 minutes, and I'm going to speak quickly here because it really should take me about 20 minutes to go through this material, and give you a snapshot of the medical and scientific research that's been done to date in an attempt to analyze and perhaps understand whether this stuff has an effect, and if it does, why it should have an effect, and what kind of effects it would have. Now, this is fairly preliminary stuff, but it's what's been done to date, and I'll just share it with you. <coughs> the first piece of research is something which predates um, us and our interest, and, and that is that about 10 years ago, um, a research lab somewhere in the United States, I don't actually remember where, published a study which set the world of physiology kind of on its head. It was so controversial that after it was published, it was repeated in 10 different laboratories around the world, and they, valid they validated it, they verified it, and so it's accepted now, but nobody knew why the heck this happened. And what this was is that there's a particular organ in the body, it's the thalamus. The thalamus is located where my two fingers are intersecting, right at the center of your head. The cells in the thalamus, they're, they're actually neurons, like the cells in your brain are, which is to say that they, they have long fingers extending from them, and each finger reaches into another neuron, another cell in the brain, in the body, and communicates with it via firing electrical impulses and chemical activity. So these neurons, these communicating cells that make up the thalamus, it turns out, fire or communicate with the brain and the body at different rates depending upon what direction we're facing. In other words, some of the neurons in the thalamus fire fully, that is, are communicating at a high volume only when we're facing north, for example. And then as we turn away from north, these particular neurons fire or speak less and less and less, and by the time we're facing south, they're silent, they're not communicating at all. Now, I said north, but it's true for all the different directions. There are different neurons in the thalamus that 
fire when we're oriented in each of the different directions and then are silent by the time we turn 180 degrees away from that particular direction. Now this is really quite baffling. Why should a part of the brain, a part of our body, be able to tell what direction we're facing? This was done on, on, on laboratory animals who were in the dark, by the way. How, why should it know what direction we're facing and why should it be communicating with the brain differently directing, depending upon what direction we're facing? Nobody had ever thought that this might be something that happened in the body. So first of all, what the heck does the thalamus do that will help us to make sense of this piece of research? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so actually the brain sits on top of the thalamus, kind of rests around it, and that's the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum, the old part of the brain sits behind it. And then the brain stem reaches down from the thalamus and then down through our spinal column to the whole body. So, and the, the cells or the uh, uh, neurons in the thalamus, some of them reach up into the brain, into the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex, and others of them reach down through the brain stem towards the rest of the body. So basically, what this means is that any communication between the brain and the body has to pass through the thalamus. We've probably all heard of this phrase, mind-body connection, in other contexts. But the actual, real, physical mind-body connection in our body is the thalamus. So it's a very, very important part of our body. And the discovery was that it is transmitting information between the mind and the body differently depending upon our orientation. Now, there's another thing that the thalamus does. It is the head of something called the limbic system. This is the physiology lecture right now. You'll be quizzed afterwards, but it's very short. Um, there's a system which consists of the thalamus and the hypothalamus and the pituitary and the adrenals and the thyroid gland. And they, the thyroid in particular, they all secrete hormones, usually into the bloodstream, and the thalamus is kind of the leader of this whole limbic system and, and controls it all. And the secretions, the hormones that they secrete into the bloodstream control everything about us that changes, which is quite a bit. Aging is controlled by, by this hormonal system. Growth, our emotions, uh, our mood, same as the emotions pretty wide range of who we are is, is, is controlled by the chemicals that the limbic system dumps into our bloodstream. And that is controlled by this thing which functions differently depending upon our orientation. So for the first time through this experiment, which wasn't done by um, a meditating scientist, it's just something we happened to find, we have a glimmer of insight into why maybe orientation matters. But then the question is, does it matter? Do we, actual, do we actually function differently when we're facing different directions? So a, uh, a researcher who's a, a physician and uh, a physiologist and a professor at Ohio State University who's done research on um, Maharshi Ayurvedic products in the past was curious and he set up a test among the many principles of, of orientation in, in Maharshi's Tapajaved is one set of recommendations about the influence of sleeping with your head pointing in different directions. And it says, for instance, that if you sleep with your head pointing east, it will have a good effect upon you. If you sleep with your head pointing north, and that's the top of the head, by the way, while you're trying to figure out what direction you sleep. North has the worst, has a real negative effect upon us, okay? So he took laboratory animals, he put them in, in very narrow cages that he designed when it was bedtime, such that he knew what direction they were gonna have to sleep in. And he had half of them, when it was bedtime, oriented so they had to sleep with their heads to the east, and half of them so they were gonna sleep with their heads to the north. And when he woke up, he took blood samples from them, and he analyzed the content of stress hormones in the bloodstream. Now, these are hormones secreted by this system, the limbic system, and each one of these different hormones is a communicator to a different organ in our body that tells it, uh-oh, we're under stress, you have to work harder. One of them, the one that we've heard of, is cortisone, which has that effect upon the heart. 
when the thyroid pumps cortisone into the bloodstream, then the heart beats faster. Can't do it for long, but it does it for a while when the, when the body tells it it has to. So what he found out was that the animals who were made to sleep with their heads to the north had elevated levels of these stress hormones in their bloodstream, and the animals who had to sleep with their heads to the east had reduced levels of stress hormones in their bloodstream, which is to say that the limbic system has some reason why it thinks that it's more stressful to sleep with your head to the east, uh, to the north, and less stressful to sleep with your head to the east, and you don't have to work so hard. The body doesn't have to function so hard if you're sleeping with the head to the east, and it has to work a lot harder if you're sleeping with the head to the north. Now, why should the body have evolved with that impression? Because consciously, we don't know that. We don't think that it matters what direction you face, but your body does. Why should it be? Well, Stipachevade tells us there are, and I don't have a real precise explanation, but Stipachevade pays a lot of attention to the effects that all of the celestial energies, the, as I said, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, passing overhead from east to west have on us. The magnetic north pole, the magnetic um, energies pass from north to south. That these have some effect upon brain functioning. Subtle effect, real effect. And that basically these energy rays some of them going from east to west, some going from north to south, kind of superimpose a kind of grid of north-south and east-west lines around the Earth, and we kind of exist within that grid. Okay? Now, we'll come back to that. But then Stipachevade has this whole body of knowledge about different activities and, and building orientations and such with respect to this grid, okay? So now we come back to this research. This, this uh, physician was also curious whether there were any differences in the behavior of the animals after they woke up. He knew about the hormone levels. So he had research assistants observe the animal's behavior after they woke up. And what they observed was that the animals who had been made to sleep with their heads to the north fought with each other, displayed aggressive and antisocial behavior, which is what you expect if these stress, the stress hormones are elevated, you feel cranky, you know? And the animals who slept with their heads to the east display, displayed peaceful behavior with each other. Very, very interesting, but we're not laboratory animals. Does it affect us? So there's a, a physician here in Fairfield, Veronica Butler, some of you may know her, who is an Ayurvedic physician. She's been trained in the limb of the Vedas that has to do with health, uh, medicine. And she thought of an ingenious way to test this for human beings. Because you see, we've all heard of the placebo effect. If you expect something's gonna happen to you, you're probably gonna experience that happening to you. And we can't set up an experiment where we, where we test 100 families in Stipachevedic houses who built those houses and they're living in them and compare them to 100 families who don't because the families in the Stipachevedic houses are expecting some benefit. That wouldn't be a very scientific experiment. So she came up with a very, very clever idea. She has a private practice in Atumwa. She's a family, she has a family practice. Her patients in Atumwa are not familiar with Vedic sciences. They don't practice transcendental meditation. And she just gave all of her patients over a several month period a survey to fill out. And the survey asked, I'm not talking fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> the survey asked a lot of questions. One series of questions was, draw a little floor plan of your house, draw your bed, show which way you sleep on the bed, Put the, tell us which way is north, so we know which way your house is oriented and which way your bed is oriented. And then she had them all take a standard mental health exam, which measures your depression and anxiety. She had them answer some questions which would document how prosperous the family had been since they lived in the house, and how stable their marriage had been since they lived in the house. And then, and then she had some researchers correlate the data. And what they determined was that there's a very strong correlation between the direction that your bed faces and your mental health. If your bed faces north, you have more depression and anxiety. If your bed faces east, you have less. 
And that then they also look for a correlation between the direction the house faces, where the, where the door is, and again, mental health and prosperity and stability of the family. And there were correlations in all of those things as to Pachavedi would, would predict, which is that, and I haven't said this previously, but I think everybody in the room knows this, east is best, south is worse. South doors, as everybody knows, because there are businesses that close up their south doors on the square, have the most negative effect upon the users of the house. And that's what she found in this experiment, that people at south doors had, had um, worse, more depression and anxiety, had, had less stable marriages, and, and had um, um, less prosperity, and east doors had more. Okay? So very, very interesting. And it's basically, it's, it's so fascinating because I, I thought for a while, and I could never think of how you could construct what's called a double blind experiment testing Stepachevade. But she actually did. That is to say, the people being tested didn't know what they were being tested on. And the researcher who was collecting the data didn't, couldn't influence the data collection. So very, very interesting. There's been a fourth study. Um, I'll skip it because of time. These studies taken together really begin to give us some insight into how it could be that orientation might matter, might affect how we work, how our bodies work. And because it affects hormone levels and affects mood and all that, could affect clarity of thinking, which would affect success in business, could affect our mental health directly, um, and uh, if it affects psychology, it could affect stability of the family, how healthy the marriage is. And so these, the, the goals, the benefits that Stipat, Maharshi Stepachevade says that it will provide health, happiness, um, and prosperity, we're beginning to understand some mechanism where it may be happening. Not fully understood in scientific terms, but a beginning. So I just wanted to share that with you. Now, I have really only about five more minutes, and so I'm going to very quickly cover a few other things. One is, what are the main elements that you see in Stepachevade buildings, and why the heck are they in them? One of them that we all know about is that they have skylights or a cupola in the center of the roof. I'm sure everybody has spotted those. And they have a little, a little ornament on top of those. What's that about? I'll tell you about the second element first, and then that'll help us to answer this first one. The second one, which many of you know, is that there's something special about the center, the very physical center on the ground floor of any Stepachevade building. You don't walk on it, you set it aside, usually you put something on it to mark it, a fountain, some, some flowers, something else. Um, and that has a name, and probably you all can tell me the name, it's the Brahmastan. What does that word mean? Brahma means wholeness, stan means established. And so it's, it's the place in the building where wholeness is established, where the totality of the entity which is the building, that thing, is created. And, and remember I said principle number two is placement. All the activities are placed around the silent center. And it's a very important part of making it all work. So every Stepachevade building has a Brahmastan, a silent center that you don't walk on. Under ideal circumstances, it's actually open to the sky. But most of us choose not to have holes in our roof in Fairfield, <laughs> Iowa. So most Brahmastans have a, have a skylight or a clear story over them that lets light into it. There's a little ornament on top of that. If you have, if you have the cupola with light, um, the, the ornament on that is called a kalash. And that is a traditional element that comes out of this um, system. Um, it also, we are told, has some beneficial effect upon the building, upon the users. I can't tell you how. I'll be very frank about it. But that's part of the body of knowledge. There are many things within it that I, I cannot lay out for you the theory or the um, reasoning behind. And that's because the origin of this knowledge, like all of the rest of Vedic knowledge, was not scientific inquiry, which is the basis for, the, for gaining of knowledge within our culture. Rather, it is that 
The thesis is that there have been men or women in the past who have been unusually highly evolved and who are able to s simply see or cognize the mechanics of the laws of nature. We know there are beautiful stories, for instance, of Einstein, who described that some of his greatest discoveries were just things that he was able to see. He just knew that the universe had to work this way, and then it was a matter of figuring out the science behind it. Or that Crick and Watson, who discovered DNA, one of those two, just had a dream in which he saw this double helix. And the thesis about Vedic knowledge is that it wasn't arrived at by Western scientific inquiry, but that there were people who were so, whose minds were so clear that they could simply see or intuit, through intuition, know how things work in different areas of natural law, and that there was one tradition that discovered this knowledge about establishment and about buildings. And that's why there are some elements of it, like the Kalash, that if you asked me, I couldn't tell you why does it have to be exactly that proportion and why does it have to be there? Because it wasn't arrived at through scientific inquiry. And yet, this medical and scientific research that's been conducted over the last few years gives us quite a bit of assurance that there's something to this. And I, obviously, with a great deal of enthusiasm, say, take it all, do it right, and have the benefits. And what are the benefits and what are people experiencing? Well, um, I could read you, actually, stories from um, uh, uh, anecdotes uh, from people living in the buildings. Brenda will, will give her the, the stories of her own, her own office building, so I won't take any more time talking about that. The, the experiences people have are fantastic. They're very enthusiastic. They see improvements in many areas of their lives, and, and I'll just leave it at that. So the way that it works is that um, uh, Maharshi, over the course of 20 years of focusing on this, um, stripped away a lot of, of um, errors that crept in over the thousands of years since the original um, seers cognized these laws of nature. And he finally, after looking around India, selected a single Stapati or Stapachavedic architect who he felt had the purest, the most intact knowledge of this ancient system, and he's worked with him very extensively, and with one Westerner, a fellow from Switzerland, who's, who's been working with him for about 20 years, to systematize this body of knowledge with Maharshi's insights. And then, three and a half years ago, as I said, he set up a consultation service for North America that functions through our company, through Maharshi Global Construction. So the way that it works is that if somebody wants to build a Stapachavade building, they sign up with us. Usually somebody has an architect if it's a larger building. And we just work with their architect. We don't design the building for them, but we, we give them all the principles that they will need on a case-by-case -case basis so that they can modify the design that they're doing for their building to incorporate all of these principles. In some cases, we design the buildings ourselves. I'm designing some buildings such as the Dreyer Building, which just opened on the MUM campus, and some buildings in other parts of the world for the Transcendental Meditation Organization. We also have pre-designed many houses and apartment buildings. So to simplify the process, people can just come to us and pick a design out. Um, that's basically how it kind of is disseminated. So 33 minutes, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan has to pass his mic over to Jeff, and while he's doing that, um, if would you want to pass out some of the pads, the paper, if anyone's interested in jotting down some questions while some of this is still fresh in our minds. Some of the things that we asked Jeff to talk about, and he may address a lot of these specifically or deviate somewhat from what we've asked. Um, some things that he finds interesting about the principles, because he is involved in the construction process. Uh, the challenges that he faces as a contractor during the construction process, the different materials that are used that may be seen um, different than what traditional structures around town have, have used, and what he might think the future holds for the construction business in Fairfield regarding these sp specific principles. So we'll turn it over to Jeff Andyway now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not real good at speeches, but I'm just going to uh, hope I can do my best here. 
I'm Jeff Andyway, the president of Andyway Construction Incorporated. I was born and raised in this area, and my father, Leonard Andyway, started Andyway Construction Incorporated over 35 years ago. And he's built over 300 homes and has done numerous remodeling in his career. I worked from, for him from the time I could pick up a hammer until I moved to South Florida in 1980. I founded Andyway Construction Incorporated in Florida and enjoyed a thriving business in, in residential and commercial construction, including remodeling. I have seen construction change a lot over the years, including major differences in the building codes for different climates and soil conditions. My beautiful wife, Debbie, and I have two young boys, Nicholas, which came with me tonight, and Brandon, who had to stay home. And we decided in 1996 it was time to move back to my Iowa hometown to instill the good values and lifestyle I grew up with in our children. My father retired and I immediately started building a home for Dan and Eloise Raymond. I feel probably a lot of you probably know him, know them. And uh, my father had previously built a home for them before we built this latest one. Uh, this was my first experience using the Stapatcha Veda principles. I'm not sure I say that right, but I, it, I'm still learning that. <laughs> my crew and I found it particularly interesting and challenging to learn about and construct a home specifically designed for these families. Our next project was a home for John and Ellen Muleman and am currently in the final stages of Eddie, Ed and Vicki Malloy's beautiful home. We have completely completed many other projects, but the beauty of these homes makes me realize this is what I would prefer to build. As a good carpenter with very talented crew, we can appreciate using many skills on these homes not normally used in the Midwest. I do love a challenge and as a builder have realized many challenges in these homes, but they are always overcame by the close collaboration between the homeowner, my very conscientious crew, the architect and myself. One of the challenges is the exact preciseness of dimensions requested for these homes. Dimensional lumber and wood materials not always being the same thickness can create one challenge. Wood with different moisture densities can change with outside air temperatures, also causing a large home to change dimensions with the temperature changes. Most of the materials used that we found are used are standard building materials, although if there is a more environmentally safe product, the homeowner will usually choose this one. In Fairfield, my crew and I have enjoyed working for some of the most pleasant people I've ever met and during the process of building their dream home, have also became very good friends with them. In closing, I hope the future is very bright for Stapachevada structures because in my opinion, Fairfield or any community would only benefit from the beautiful architecture and the high quality of these buildings and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Now we're passing the mic to Terry Hayes, the Century 21 Realty. Uh, some of the items that we'd ask him to address as well. Uh, the points of interest that he notices in the real estate market regarding the Stapachevade structures how the market values have possibly been affected both in commercial and residential structures, what questions are posed by potential buyers about the structures, are people changing their houses to conform to these principles to increase the marketability, and has the appraisal process been affected by these structures and their value? Let's turn over to Terry Hayes. Hi. Can you tell if this is where it needs to be? Okay, great. So this is going to be the drier portion of the uh, program, and if I talk fast, I can slip five minutes back over to Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> I have been active in real estate in Fairfield since 1990. Uh, my wife and I own Century 21 Hayes Realty, having bought the business and the building in 1993. 
I'm going to give you a brief overview of the market as it stands today. Uh, actually, I'll give you a little history also. In 1998, there were 214 properties sold through the multiple listing service. 120 of the properties were over 60,000. 94 were under $60,000 sale price. In 1999, there were 163 properties sold through the multiple listing service. Uh, 93 were over 60,000. 70 were under 60,000. That's a 24% decrease from from 98, you know, in 99. The total total dollar value in 99 was 11 million five hundred eighty thousand eight hundred forty dollars. Now that's just strictly through the multiple listing service. That's not for sale by owners. That's not an exclusive listing maybe that you had that sold quickly. That's just things that were reported to the multiple listing service where all the realtors belong. Currently, there are 203 properties listed for sale on the on the service. We have had as high as 300. I've broken those properties down. Seven of them are over 200,000. 12 properties are from 150 to 200,000. 24 properties are from 125 to 149.9. 15 properties are from 100 to 124.9. 23 are from, from 75 to 99.9. 47 properties are from 50,000 to 74,900. And 46 properties are 25,000 to 49,000. The balance are properties under 25,000, which would be mostly lots. The highest price house that's sold so far this year, and this is not an MLS sale, but just a general highest price house, 617500 um, <laughs> What points of interest have I noticed in the real estate market regarding Stipachevedic structures? <laughs> they're, they're so new, they're being built primarily for uh, people that are having them built just for their use. They haven't been re-entered on the market you know, too much for sale. So primarily we have a lot of curiosity. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, none have been sold to the multiple listing service and only a couple of contractor spec homes have been sold by any realtor. How have market values been affected? Commercially, uh, office buildings have been affected as the nice new Stipachevedic office buildings have been built and filled up with tenants, putting a lot of pressure on the older buildings. If you have new and you have Stipachevedic design, it's not a very tough, tough decision where you want to be. You know, and it, it, a lot of the older buildings are quite old and you know, it's just not a decision between new and Stipachevedic all at once. Residentially, and I pulled several other brokers to get a consensus, uh, and their opinion as well as mine was that as a percentage of the market, there has been little effect as of yet, except for perhaps some of the very high-end properties. They're maybe not as easy to turn as they once were. Uh, we get a lot of people that come in and are looking for that perfect naturally existing Stipachevedic home, but I defy them to find one that faces east, and you walk in through the east door, the kitchen's immediately on your left in the front. Uh, they just, they haven't been designed that way historically. Uh, now, the market was down a little last year. Uh, we all attributed that to other factors. We had a couple of strikes at some major employers. A bankruptcy reorganization and buyout at another major employer. Another large company sold and the parent company stated at the time we'll be here at least two years. The, and I had calls after that one from people wanting to know should I finish remodeling my basement <laughs> or am I going to get my money out. Uh, also there were interest <laughs> rates starting back up and concerns over Y2K. People were not flowing into town the last year. Hopefully that is behind us and we can look forward now. However, one broker did report some current buyer hesitation due to the rare cosmic alignment of planets that is forthcoming. What questions are posed by potential buyers about the structures? Again, they're too new for us. Uh, they haven't been put on the market really for resale. There isn't much sales history locally. And therefore, potential buyers go to the, to the developer builder for the questions. Uh, are people changing their houses to conform to these principles to increase marketability? No. Some people are changing the entrances on their homes, but they do it because they want to. It's not going to increase the marketability. And we can't suggest anybody to invest money to remodel. If this is something they want to pursue, uh, it's probably best to, to do it new. Has the appraisal process been affected by these structures and their value? I am not an appraiser, and so I can only answer this question with secondhand knowledge. And my understanding, and I did you know, can, canvas a few appraisers, 
is that the appraisal process has not been affected, but Stapachevedic homes have created their own market. non stapachevada homes cannot be used as comparables and reach the de desired sales value. Now, that's about appraising. This has nothing to do with the assessment process. <laughs> and I, I want to well, distinguish that point. Yes. <laughs> so, that does it for me. Thank you. Uh, while she's putting her mic on, I would like to say that I'm glad everybody has a little different taste because it'd make my job boring if everybody had the same mm -hmm. taste. Uh, and there wouldn't be a need for Baskin Robbins either, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd hate to see for 50% of our, our inventory to get eliminated because everybody had the same, you know, same taste. Thank you. Um, some of the questions that we posed to Brenda. Why did you decide to build using the Stapachevade building principles? What benefits did you expect and what has been realized to date? Do any issues come up with employees, either in a positive or negative sense, about the structure? Brenda Narducci. Thanks. Um, why we decided to build stapachavedically? Well, I've been practicing transitional meditation for 29 years. And my experience has been with Maharishi anyway, when he says something about a person's individual experience with respect to consciousness, if you give it time, it usually seems to hold true. So when he said that there, there was this one thing that struck me. Uh, my husband is from Chicago, and when we first were married, we lived in Chicago. And he was talking about orientations of the buildings facing east before he even got into the specifics of Stapachevade. And I was thinking about this, this one restaurant on Ogden Avenue, which in Chicago is 34 that has had restaurant after restaurant after restaurant that has failed, has failed, has failed. And you wonder, I mean, it's an incredible location, but why did every restaurant that ever goes into that place fail? So when he said orientation could cause success, I thought, aha, that may be why that restaurant failed. I don't know, but it was just, it was such a cool and new novel idea, I thought, I'm ready to hear this. So I happened to be over in Holland, and it was when um, Doug Greenfield uh, decided to take on the challenge to help reconstruct the United States with Stapach of Aid. Um, and at the time, we had outgrown our present building, and so I decided if he thinks he can reconstruct the United States, I can at least build an office building that's to patchivate it. And so I wanted to see if it could, in fact, uh, increase prosperity, and also if it would increase the well-being of the people that worked in our building. The test of that will come in the next two months. We are a very seasonal business. Starting about a week ago, we kick into high gear and we go until the middle of July at very intense, uh, very intense schedules. Um, what I do for my company is design uh, products that are going to go out, such as leaflets that are sales literature, basically. And so my busy season is about two months before everybody else's. And just to kind of give you some idea since we've been in this building which we moved in in October our business has increased 33 percent we're a 25 year old business that does not happen it has never happened to us before if we were in the double digits that was just remarkable as far as we were concerned but to have that kind of uh, good fortune uh, our, our um, what you would call those people who compete against us were coming to us asking us to buy them. And it just kept happening. I mean, it was unbelievable. We just bought another, we bought two very significant um, companies. And so now the challenge will be for us to execute uh, what we've taken on. Um, and for me, the challenge just over the last three months was to be able to get all that literature which kept changing as we kept increasing because 
we were buying other companies and they have slightly different styles of functioning that and we had to integrate them. So it was an enormous task and I feel, you know, I weathered it pretty good. I'm still here. <laughs> Haven't had a heart attack. I'm still functioning. And um, so it'll be really neat to see what happens at the end of our busy season because, you know, the proof will be in the money coming in if, if, if it really does happen. Um, also, another interesting thing, we've been in business 25 years. No one has ever come to visit us from another company anywhere in America. We have had dot coms wanting to partner with us come from as far as Israel to visit us. Again, I don't know where it's all coming from, but I have to give some credit to the building. Um, and that's what Maharishi originally said. He said success would come. And so we'll see at the end of July and August when we add up and subtract all the expenses if we have in fact made more money, which I believe probably will happen. Um, but so I've seen, you know, very direct in terms of my own well-being, I'm feeling pretty good probably going through the most stressful last three and a half, four months of my life because I thought, oh, the building's done now, I'll get to relax. <laughs> and that was exactly the opposite to what happened. And the building itself was, you know, an enormous task because my husband and I had never built anything before, so this was like a whole new, you know, so on top of that, we also increased our business. In terms of the employees, um, I think most everybody's very happy to be in this building. It's a very luxurious feeling compared to what we were in. Uh, we were in a Morton building down the road, and so this is much nicer. In terms of it being Stapacha Vedic, I think the biggest complaints are um, the long walk. <laughs> the only complaint I've heard is that when it's raining, it's a long walk. They don't mind it when it's cold, when it's hot, they don't mind it. It's just when it's raining. Uh, we have a very large vastu, which is the relationship between this building and the land that it sits on. And um, the Stapatis gave us a vastu that was this particular building and that particular vastu was for prosperity. So. Uh, it's a little long walk, but if it works, it's okay. <laughs> um, the only other thing is just from a design element, it's very, you know, when you look at most businesses today and they're going very modular, you can shove eight people into a space if you put them in, you know, kind of like an octagon, much easier than you can if you align them all facing east. So there is what I would call wasted design space, but again, I think if what Jonathan says is true, and I happen to believe it's true just from my own personal experience, um, I think it's worth the investment of space that all the employees don't go home as tired as they did before. And um, that in and of itself is worth it. Um, trying to think of a lot of people have said very sweet things about the building. These are people that don't practice transcendental meditation, um, such as when I came into this building, I felt it was like a library. You know, there was this quiet feeling in it, and we're noisy, so I don't get it. Where's the quiet coming from? So the structure itself creates that, that settled feeling and that equanimity, and I've seen this amazing thing happen, and I don't know how to, how to explain it except um, I saw it manifest many times in the design of all these different things that I was doing over the last three months in that just before it would go to print and it was out the door, someone would discover some huge flaw. Always before those flaws were never discovered till they came back printed costing me thousands and thousands of dollars and, it, and it's 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 like magical I mean it's unbelievable actually that I've seen this happen over and over again and I just keep thinking what a blessing what a blessing because that saves so much money in the long run and again um, when we get into the busier season over the next three months where everybody else is very busy 
Um, we'll see how that, if that holds. But in my particular area, I've really noticed a significance there in terms of correcting mistakes before they get out to the public. Um, because it can be a disaster if you promise the wrong thing or say it. Or, you know, we're dealing with education, schools, we're photographing schools, so you don't want to look like an idiot with misspelled words and things like that, you know. People will proof and proof, and just before it goes to print, someone finds that misspelling or the wrong price code attributed to that or whatever. But anyway, that's kind of been our experience in the graphic arts and marketing department of this company. So we'll see. Ask me again in August. And Sounds like we need to come back. And yeah, we'll have another party. Thank you. I want to take this time, um, first of all, to mention if anyone still wants a pad of paper, has a question, turn those in to Kevin. I want to take this time, too, while we're all still paying real close attention, to thank our panelists for the time and the effort that they have put forth in, in preparing for this meeting and to help educate us and communicate to us what they have experienced with these Apache Bay building principles. So again, I thank each and every one of you. Now I'll take the questions, and we'll go through those, and we'll just pass the mic to whoever will be responding. I'll, I'll just read them. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read them all. Looks like our first question is for Jonathan. Please address rectification or modification of an existing structure to bring into MSV standards. Rectification is the word that we use to describe what you can sometimes do to modify an existing building to incorporate as many as possible of the principles of Maharshi Stipachevate into it. Um, and one of the obvious things you can do to rectify a building is if it doesn't have an east entrance or a north entrance to stop using the west or south entrances and use the east or north entrance. There are many other things that sometimes can be done and we actually have a service uh, through Maharshi Global Construction in which people enroll and they have their floor plans drawn up and they give them to us and then we see how many of the elements can be incorporated into the house without too dramatic uh, modification of it and what are the most economical modifications that can be made. Um, if you were to say that you get 100% benefit from, Stipat from Maharshi Stipachevate in a new building, we really say that, frankly, the best you could possibly get in a rectification is maybe 50%. That's if, if you can do all of the things that you can sometimes do in a rectification, and usually it's less than that. If a building, for instance, is rotated not towards north, south, east, west, then you really can't even start. And so we just we wouldn't, we wouldn't think about rectifying that. So that's what that is. I have another question for you, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Is the placement of rooms affected when a building is constructed in the southern hemisphere instead of the northern hemisphere? For example, will the kitchen mm -hmm. be in a different location? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. No, this, this, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. It comes up often. Um, and we talk about the energies of the sun passing overhead. And of course, most of us are aware that in the summertime, the sun is more in the southern hemisphere, and in the wintertime, it rises over in, uh, in the northern hemisphere. And uh, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. It's, it rises very low in the southern hemisphere in the winter, and it, it's way up overhead in the, in the northern hemisphere in the summertime, and that that's reversed in the southern part of the world. And so do maybe some of the placements of rooms move around? And the answer is simply no, that um, the passage of energy overhead is from east to west. And the placements have to do with that, and that doesn't differ. So that's the answer. The next question is for Jeff. And the question is, why do you prefer to build this Depachave type of homes? Uh, I enjoy building them because the architecture is, is uh, seems like it's been so beautiful, and uh, for years upon years, what I've seen locally is the buildings don't have any 
I don't know. The, the, they just don't have any style, any, any. Uh, they don't have a good feeling to them. They're just a place to walk in and, and lay their shoes down and go to sleep and eat. It. The these buildings have uh, a certain style about them that I just I like. I mean. I don't know how to explain it. It's uh, maybe there's something to it. I don't know. <laughs> so a second part of a question uh, for Jeff. Let's see. What aspects of carpentry and construction are used in this type of building that are less frequently used in conventional construction? Which ones what, are used? What types of, like, what aspects of your construction process are used in this Depachevade structures that aren't necessarily used very much or if at all in the traditional structures? Well, um, pretty much the basics are all the same in the building process. Um, we get into a lot more detail with these homes. Uh, the These homes seem to have a lot more... Um, I'm, I'm looking for the right details to them. They have, uh, they're more specific on the sizes of rooms and heights of ceilings. Um, I'm kind of kept in the dark a little bit on some of this stuff too. I, I can only be told what I have to know to get it built. Um, but um, the details on the houses, we, we get to spend a lot more time because we're working with good homeowners that are willing to spend the money to do it right. We're, we're uh, putting a lot of fine detail into these homes that that you don't normally see and I haven't really seen a lot in this Midwest, uh, or especially in this area. What is the re Jonathan, I'm sorry. What is the reasoning behind the detached garage? <clears throat> There's two part answer. Um, and the first part I can't I can't um, probably give a very satisfactory answer to, but there, there was a, there is a, a theoretical basis when you, you take the, the classical knowledge and you look at outbuildings um, and what their relationship should be to the main building that um, leads to the conclusion that the outbuilding should be away from the house. And we've talked about Vastu, though I haven't defined it as it's, it's the house and the yard around it, which is enclosed within a, a, um, a fence or a wall that the outbuildings such as the garage would be away from the house and outside. And I mean, I'd have to go into quite a bit of theory to kind of give a, a pass on it. Doesn't, I don't think it really matters. It's just that, that this, was, this was the conventional understanding based upon Stepachevade theory. But about three years ago, um, one of the families in this community, um, Fred and Shelley Gratson, uh, were having a house built. And, and Shelley said to um, Maharishi, um, you know, it's a real nuisance having a, having a garage some distance away from the house in, in Iowa. And, you know, he thought about it for a minute. He said, well, Stepachevade is for comfort. And so, of course, you could have a garage that's attached to your house. And, and since that point, we've been doing it. So that's the second <laughs> half of the question. OK, we have one for Terry. Oh, what a deal. <laughs> What is the ideal price point for a spec house in Fairfield? Uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, you know, what market are you trying to hit? Uh, there's no real answer to that except for the higher your price is, the more you limit your buyers and the more particular your buyers are. And, and so uh, it depends if you're going for entry level or mid-level or upper level. But uh, I guess I need a little more, a little more help defining that question. Okay, maybe whoever wrote that could speak with Terry yeah, afterwards. The question is, that, that as far as qualified buyers walking in the door, mm -hmm. what, what are most of them looking for in terms of price? Well, that, there's, a, there's a variance. I mean, you have some that are looking at entry-level housing. They've never bought a house before, so they can't afford what the mid-level manager can afford. 
so you have like three or four different stratospheres almost of buyers, but uh, which which air, which price point is is least filled in in, in what what how where do we need the most houses? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, right if you uh, if you could build one uh, much under a hundred, that would be you couldn't sell enough. But they also have to be so they'll hold up, and so that becomes the challenge. Um, and so we have pretty good movement between 100 and 150, but not as much as we have under 100. But you can't hardly build a new house under 100 that is acceptable. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, back to Jonathan. Is it true that buildings over 40 years of age are undesirable according to Vedic principles? No. <laughs> Well, that was easy. Okay. Um, actually, I have another one for yeah, another Jonathan. One. Okay. Can stipatchivate principles be used in modular homes? Uh, good question. Yes, they certainly can. And we've worked with um, a couple of uh, factory built housing companies here in Fairfield in an attempt to uh, meet the market for uh, the market that, that you were just talking about at, at the, the, the lower and middle end. Uh, of the marketplace. Um, Jeff has alluded to the, the precision that's required in, in working on Stipachevade buildings. I mentioned of these four aspects of, of Maharshi Stipachevade, orientation, placement, proportion, and materials. Number three, proportion. When we give these proportions, which by the way are just kind of modifications of room sizes that you give us. It's not that we tell you that your bathroom has to be 30 feet long. But once, once we work out these, these dimensions, which, which which are derived according to these natural formulas, then the benefit that you get from them is associated with how accurately you can, you can hit those dimensions. And so, and so we ask the framer to frame as accurately as, as they reasonably can. Um, and uh, that's, that's you know, been kind of a learning curve and, and probably also a, a challenge and, and, and a reason why some of the contractors get so much pleasure or, or pride out of, out of completing these houses because they've had to build them to a higher level of craftsmanship. Okay, we have a question for Brenda. How have your employees who are not meditators, or how do they deal with how they work in the building facing east? Has there been any of They thing? face east. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe has there been any, um, did the desks face? The yeah, way? all the, I could take you and show you the big production room. They all face east. And I designed the, I know how our business works, so I pretty much designed the, the lay of this desk before I actually designed the rooms. Because I knew how we were growing in it the hopeful speed we would grow over a five to 10 year period because I never wanted to build another building after I built this building. We oversized this building for us. And so we laid everything out so you could face everybody east. That was the ideal originally. So we set everything up. We ordered 150 desks and um, they're all pretty much facing east. There's a lot that you know, a lot of people now have two desks because they have a computer and uh, a, a writing desk, we could say that. Um, so sometimes people face north and east um, if they have one of those L shapes. I don't know if that meets the qualifications, but that's the way we did it. And um, so that's pretty much it. Okay, we have a request here, which I think would be good to cover. Um, Jonathan had to cut short on his explaining the fourth research study. And someone has asked if you could please describe that okay. study. Well, there's been a lot of research that many of you have probably heard about that documents a phenomenon, which is that groups of people meditating together have an effect upon the people who are in their environment. Um, the studies have been mainly documenting how when you get, get enough people meditating or practicing the TM cities together, that it lowers the crime rate in that community. And um, this is as, as Maharshi and as this tradition predicts, which is that um, when you can introduce 
we think of consciousness as being a field, like, like um, electromagnetism is a field, and like some parallels in physics to do with electromagnetism, when you can introduce a certain amount of order into that field, suddenly it causes order throughout the field. And Maharshi has predicted that, and when we finally had enough meditators and we had some big courses where people got together in one city, lo and behold, the crime rate dropped in that city. Uh, easy to document, and it's been published. So the hypothesis was, well, might it be that you build one of these buildings, the people living in the building have, therefore, more coherence. Will it have some effect extending outside of the house onto other people? And one of the professors here uh, at, at MUM, Fred Travis, um, who actually has an architectural design background, so maybe that's why he was thinking about architecture, even though he's a psychologist, came up with a very novel way of testing this. He decided to look at the crime statistics in Fairfield. There isn't a lot of crime here, so he just took burglaries. There, there are some a certain amount of burglaries. He went back about three years till he had a, a hundred burglaries, or actually 110. Fairfield, of course, is most of Fairfield is laid out in north, south, east, west grid. So almost all of the houses in Fairfield face one of the four cardinal directions. So they went to the police department. Uh, his research assistants copied on a list of the last 110 burglaries. They checked the addresses and the orientation of each of the houses. They eliminated the houses that didn't face one of the four cardinal directions. And then they calculated the correlation between the direction a house faces and how often houses got burglarized. And what, he, because, you know, Stepatjave, the thesis is, and I didn't actually give this before, if a house faces east, the predicted benefits are your desires will be more easily fulfilled and you will grow in expansion of consciousness and enlightenment. All good things. If, if your building faces north, it will bring prosperity. If your building faces west, it will bring decline. If your building faces south, it's a, it's a whole list of s serious negative things. <laughs> the worst. Okay. So, so he just, so now actually it turns out that Fairfield is not right on the grid. It's actually about seven degrees off, I understand. And so we wouldn't expect that if there is an effect that we would actually see a pure demonstration of it on Fairfield's houses, because we're really not quite there. But what, what did come out, east, west, north, were all really about the same, statistically indistinguishable. But south-facing houses were burglarized 75% more often. Oh my God. Uh, this, by the way, along with the, the, the study by Dr. Butler in Ottumwa, um, are about to be published in an international peer review social psychology magazine. And we look forward to them being critted and reviewed by other scientists. So that was the fourth study. Go ahead and keep that. We have time, I think, just for one more question. I think mm -hmm. this one would be interesting. Uh, do you feel that the Maharishi Stepachavade knowledge is stable now and will not evolve and change much over time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you said, do I feel and not do I know, because I don't know. but. Um, last summer, um, I was able to spend two months on a course with our Stepati just studying theory. And um, over the course of the last three, basically, I think that we had kind of the beta model for the first few years as this knowledge was coming out. I suspect that when our company was founded, when Maharishi decided, to make a company in the United States, and he asked Doug if he would be the president of it, which Doug does for free, by the way, he doesn't make any money out of it, um, to promote the construction of these buildings across America, and which has led to a, a huge increase in the, in the amount of stipatuvate activity all around the United States, that he was doing that, can you remember the first part of the sentence? <laughs> that he was, he took the step in founding this company three and a half years ago, I think in part because he decided that the knowledge was out now. It was, it was really pretty well known, and it wasn't going to change a whole lot. There was one change that happened about three years ago, not a major one. And he brought out one new principle about 14 months ago. Um, that's not much over three years. <laughs> My opinion, and also based upon having done this long theory course last summer, is that the knowledge is 95 or something percent of the knowledge is out, and it's really quite stable. 
Good. Thank you very much. Um, again, on behalf of the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce and the Community Relations Committee, I would like to again thank everyone for their attendance and um, interest in this subject. And so we're going to cut it off here because we set our time frame to an hour and a half. And if you have any further questions, I'm sure our panelists will stick around to help answer some of those. Thank you. Thank you.